may be wondering what that was for. I had a sore throat, I needed a drink. <laughs> While I have your attention, I know that a lot of you got lost in that last 10 minutes, okay? I started talking about making a new universe, and that was great, and then just sort of blah, 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 protons, neutrons, something about stars. Let me just summarize that, because in the second half of this talk, things are going to be different. We're going to, uh, there's not going to be no blah, blah, protons. We're going to ask what this means. But let me just give you a summary of what I've said so far, just to get everyone back on board. Let this white space here be the menu of all the universes that you could order. The way you're going to order it is, you're going to take a pin and stick it in at a certain point. That's going to order your universe, all of it. How it starts, all the forces, how they work, how strong they are. Right? Now, what we're going to do with all these universes is we're going to start top left and go through every single one of them. We're going to ask this question. Could life live in that universe? If it can't, if you end up with a universe that's just dead, boring, no life, no nothing, we're going to colour it in black. Otherwise, we're going to leave it white. So the black ones are dead universes, the white ones are universes that could support life, and for fun, we'll stick houses in the middle. What you get, after all these calculations, the scientists have been doing for the last 30 years, is something that looks a bit like this. world's hardest dartboard, basically. <laughs> the smallest changes in the way that our universe works ruin it for life. What does that mean? What should we conclude from that? I mean, it's just a pretty straightforward scientific fact. You just go to these laws, you change things, things mess up. What does it mean? I think a good way to clear our thinking is, I'll just quickly go through four ways of getting it wrong, but I think uh, four ways, four things that it doesn't mean. Four explanations that don't work. Number one, it's just a coincidence. Any coincidence, it said Miss Marple to herself, is always worth noticing. You can always throw it away later if it is only a coincidence. I couldn't put it any better myself. Let's go looking for a better explanation. If in the end we're left with a coincidence, then I would just be not as exciting as we hoped. Number two, there's only one universe. All this talk about probability is a bit presumptuous, isn't it? I mean, how many universes have we observed? One. How many universes that we've observed have life in them? One. So there's your probability. One out of one, right? <laughs> the problem with this is there's only one actual universe. But that's the point, there's all those other possible universes. And we want to know, how did we end up in one of the tiny, tiny, tiny minority that actually support life? How did that happen? The fact that there's only one actual universe, well, there's probability. Probability is about finding what is likely or unlikely from amongst what is possible. What is actual? Not actually that interesting. One of the top quantum cosmologist in, in Britain is a guy called Christopher Eichen. Uh, and this is a quote from him that I love. Um, I've never really been that interested in the actual universe. I'm always intrigued by probabilities. What could there have been? The actual universe, of course, is interesting, but that's not what I'm studying myself. <laughs> the point is, we can investigate these possible universes, and we find that most of them are just dead. Saying, oh, there's only one actual universe. Yes, but how did it manage to support life? Number three, the explanation of life is evolution. Life can adapt itself to any situation that it finds itself in. Well, I reply this is actually quite simple. No, it can't. <laughs> Where I left the story, and I'm going to step away and hope this thing doesn't feed back on me. We left the story sort of, if we started off here, then, well, we started off over there. <laughs> At the beginning of the universe, we made sort of, we made a lumpy, we put matter in it, we, you know, we made stars, we made planets. Where I left it off, we had planets that had some chemicals on them. But that's not a living thing, right? We're talking about life. 
So what you need to do next is make a simple cell. Note the quotation marks. <laughs> because a simple cell, comparatively, is over here somewhere. If you ask a biochemist, a guy, some, a scientist who specializes in the chemistry of life, how complicated is a simple cell, even the simplest living cell? He will say something along the lines of New York City. You know, every single cell in your body, there's a hundred trillion of them. That's, that's 14 zeros if you're playing one at home. <laughs> has its own, every single cell in your body has its own postal system. Not your body, every single cell. If it needs to move a molecule from one bit of the cell to another bit of the cell, it puts a little, a little address on it, puts it in a little truck, with a little cargo hold, a little motor that goes down a little highway, to the end, someone checks that address, sorry, some chemical, these are all molecules, checks that address, unloads it, and takes it where it needs to go. That's what's on this end. We left it with just a pile of chemicals on a planet somewhere. So this, however you get from here to there, is going to be a phenomenally complicated set of chemical reactions and conditions, and we have no clue how this goes. We have a few clues, I should say that. People who uh, investigators have my admiration. It's probably the hardest topic. How do you turn that just sort of mush of chemicals into something that's alive? But the point is this. Only when you have this simple cell, this New York City ten times smaller than a single human hair that can, you know, has its own postal system, and most importantly, can rip itself in half and make a complete working copy of itself in 20 minutes, only when you get here to that cell does evolution start out that way. Because you need that self-replicating cell before it starts. So, just saying that life will adapt to whatever situation it finds itself in, no, it had all of that to start off with, and then it started adapting. Evolution always requires pre-existing order and pre-existing entities that obey that order. It follows logically that not all order evolved. To put it another way, we're not talking about what life can do. We're talking about what the universe needs to do before life can start living. Number four, the anthropic principle. This is what this whole thing is usually called. Basically, of course the universe is right for life, otherwise we wouldn't be here asking questions. <laughs> Very simple idea. How, if there's any life anywhere, it's always going to observe around it that things are pretty good for life. So how can you be surprised that you're alive and you're observing a universe that lets you be alive? <laughs> My response to this is a very famous analogy. Find a car. Suppose you're facing a firing squad. I'll leave it to your imagination how you're going to throw a firing squad.